great place to end. Okay, all right. Uh, so when we're analyzing sentences, we've mostly been focused at that word level. What are those words? So can we tokenize as we started this semester? Can we tag by adding part of speech to them? How do we add meaning, that's our classification scenarios, to those? Or how do we chunk? Okay. So we've been building up from single little words to bigger phrasal structures. And now we're going to do full sentences. And this really allows us to explore some of the inherent issues with any language. Um, English especially is an idiomatic language, meaning that we often speak in metaphors. And so that presents us two problems when working on um, analyzing sentence structure and ambiguity in sentences in meaning. Words are not a one-to-one -one pair to their meaning. Right? So if you can think about a simple word like dog, it could mean the literal little animal that barks. Or it could be slang phrase, um, meaning that somebody is uh, not a good person. Or it could be a friendly uh, slang phrase, like they're often used on American Idol, for example. Uh, so that sort of ambiguity really makes it hard to understand sentence structure. It's not like you can just tell the computer, here's what the word means, move on. Okay. And then creativity. Creativity is cool in language, but that means that we have to be flexible when writing programs that analyze sentence structure because there are lots of different possible combinations. So recursion is a big problem with creativity. So the point of this lecture um, is how do we write grammars, which is a take on last week's work, to uh, basically analyze sentences and write a grammar that's flexible enough to analyze all kinds of different sentences. Okay. And then how do we represent um, those with a syntax tree? So sometimes it's called a parse tree as well. Uh, and then um, how do we write code that does that? Okay, so how do we build a parser? And it'll be very similar to the way that we've been building things so far. So we'll write some sort of set of rules or features to extract, and then we'll tell, we'll train a parser. I use the word train loosely because we won't necessarily, um, we we'll might use the regular expression parser, right, which is just the training is just here's the rules. Uh, and then we'll test it, see if it works. All right, so uh, getting back into a little bit exploring creativity and ambiguity. Okay. Let's talk about a little about Usain Bolt because he's an amazing human. So he broke the 100 meter record like, fuck, as many times as he did, right? The Jamaica Observer reported that he broke the record. Andre said that the Jamaica reporter observed that he broke the record. And I think that Andre told me that Jamaica reporter Observer reported that he broke the record. All of these are valid sentences. All of these have the same content. Right? The important piece of the content here is that Usain Bolt broke the 100 meter sprint record and where I learned that information from. Okay. Um, that is an issue of creativity. So this is uh, the, the rule for this is called recursion. So I think that it's like, I, it's like that's included here. Um, we don't have to have the that's, but most people in English use them now. So I think that Andre said that the blah, 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 blah. So if you can use the word that in there, you've got a recursive property. Okay. And this is a template to combine embedded sentences. Okay. These are very difficult to process because you don't know if they're coming. And when they do occur, it can be difficult to deal with them. <clears throat> So here's an example from the book that's from, let's zoom out one more time, from um, Winnie the Pooh. And it gives you the previous sentence here, and then this whole thing is one sentence. Okay. That includes those recursion properties of embedded sentences and embedded clause. And yeah, it's a run on ramble thing where you're not really going to totally understand what the heck is happening because you've maxed out your brain power basically, but it is one legal sentence. Okay. Oops. All right. so that is a combination of sentences using this kind of structure. Sentence, but, sentence, 
when sentence. Okay. And that's uh, a property of recursion where we can create these sort of endlessly long sentences using this uh, but when that structure. Okay. And um, this doesn't happen as often as I'm making it sound, but uh, they are, compound sentences are pretty normal. So the difficulty becomes how do I write a grammar that is flexible enough to deal with all of these moments? So grammar is our system, our structure of the language, it's the rules that allow us to convert uh, structure into meaning. Or things like syntax are the, the, the very specific little rules, like the actor in the sentence comes first, noun, then verb kind of things. And so we're going to write a set of rules that captures the relationship between parts of speech that help us understand meaning. So here's an example of a parsed tree. And so a recursive sentence, you'll see the S's occur often. So chatterer. I hate this example because I can't say this. Chatterer, chatterer, it just ends up being like this weird noise. Um, but it's from a children's book, I believe. Said. So anytime you have the word said, you should expect another sentence. Here's a second sentence. Buster thought. I don't know. Here's the last sentence. The tree was tall. Okay. Um, and so you can see in this part tree the sort of uh, embedded nature of these sentences because they're further down the stack. Okay. So this is a hierarchical set of sentences. Okay. So how do we write code that captures this? And this is all captured under the idea of generative grammar. So generative grammar is a pretty famous linguistic theory from Chomsky. Chomsky is the father, father of um, modern linguistics. And he, basically he was saying that we all innately have this ability to transform <clears throat> structure into meaning and so language is just a set of these possible structures, okay? and the meaning is overlaid uh, based on the language you're speaking or the learned meaning of words. So uh, it argues for in the innateness of grammar, not the innateness of language as a whole. Right? Uh, so we're born with this like understanding of grammar, these logical rules that allow us to build sentences, and the meaning is built from the parts of the sentence. Okay. So uh, generative grammar is pretty well supported uh, because you'll see that uh, you can. There are some genetic difficulties, like a specific protein set and a set of genes that appear to be. I hate to use this phrase, the grammar gene. It's not quite appropriate for the way I understand biology now, but there do appear to be some small genetic components that when are not quite right, right something broken in them, uh, grammar is very difficult. Okay. So it supports this idea that we have this built-in grammar system that we just put the words on top of. Okay. Because words are just symbols. All right, a very famous Groucho Marx sentence. I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Um, there are multiple ways to create a parse tree for the sentence. And basically, it comes down to the question of who's in the pajamas. Did I shoot an elephant who's wearing my pajamas, which as adults, most of us don't think this, right? or am I shooting the elephant and I'm in the pajamas? This is our usual interpretation. Um, but depending on how you decide where this embedded clause goes, right? So this clause, does it go with the first noun, you? Does it go with the second noun, elephant? If you ask children, you get mixed answers. Um, because children aren't quite so practical, but also because of what's called late closure. So as 
people build sentences, sentence structure, their, their meaning, they're building it up in their, their head, their mental model. A, um, a, a minimal attachment is another name for this, where you stick the clause on the closest noun. And so then the elephant will be wearing the pajamas because it's the closest noun. We understand that's probably right, attached to the first uh, actor in the sentence because elephants don't wear pajamas. Okay. But that's an example of ambiguity. So this whole semester we've been talking about slots. What part of speech goes in this slot? Okay. What rules are there if there's a noun? What's going to come next? That's the most likely thing to occur before a adverb. That's the most likely thing to occur with the word would, I think, is one time what we did, or often. Okay. So words have these specific slots, is what I like to talk, call them, um, specific spots where they can and should go. Okay. Given some previous sentence word information beforehand. So we could understand sentence structure and then therefore generate our own. So one of the ultimate goals of this would be to be build like our own chat box kind of thing um, by looking at bigrams. Okay. So remember that bigrams are just pairs of words. That works a little bit. <laughs> so here is if you take a larger text and just calculate all the bigrams and then pick a random word to start, um, what you see is a sentence that is probably syntactically valid for each type of word is allowed to go in that slot, but semantically, meaning-wise, means like literally nothing, right? So he roared with me, roared with me, the pail slipped down his back. Okay, this makes no sense. Okay. The worst part and clumsy looking for whoever heard light. So what we see when we start to, to realize that um, words have slots, but it's bigger often than just pairs of words. You'll also see this. This was a game for a while that people, a meme that people did where the predictive text on your phone, so if you picked one word and then just picked the next word that it chose each time, like in the middle, um, you would get a weird sentence because it's often basing its next predictive word on the previous word. So, for example, let's see, my parents are texting me. I don't want to text them some random message, so let's send it to my better half here. So, let's say I started with the. Okay, the next word I get is only first and worst. Ah, so the worst. Uh, then I get thing, part, and is, so part. Now I have is, of, and about. So let's say worst part about this, the, me, the. The worst part about the dog day or new, let's go with dog, is that she is not going to, <laughs> I get going to Amsterdam because that's where we were recently, <laughs> get back. So you can build sentences that um, make sense, but often, maybe semantically, they're not the most meaningful. Right? But personally, the worst part about the dog is sometimes she gets riled up and starts barking her head off. <laughs> and it's not that she um, can't get back to Amsterdam, <laughs> which is what my phone was predicting I should say. Right? So there's some serious limits on that kind of system. So that idea of, of bigram prediction is tied to a very famous sentence in linguistics by Chomsky, and he used it to prove a point that um, we can build sentences that are semantic, I'm sorry, syntactically correct. Okay. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. That is an adjective, an adjective, a noun, a verb, and an adverb. It's a legal order in English of, sin of words, but it doesn't make any sense. And sometimes that's called word salad. Word salad is more applied to schizophrenia, but it's the same idea. So there are some predictions we can make, though, 
and this is called coordinate structure, where if phrase one and phrase two, so V1 and V2, variable one and two, are of the same grammatical category, okay, then V1 and V2 are also phrases of that category. Okay. So if uh, words are both nouns, they're more than likely going to be in a noun phrase, is what this says. If the words are verbs, they're most likely going to be in a verb phrase. So, um, <clears throat> here we go. Let's look at the, how this works out. The book's ending was the worst part and the best part for me. So here's a sentence. Okay. I've got this noun phrase, the worst part and the best part. Okay. And that's two noun phrases add, added together. Okay. The worst part is a noun phrase and the best part is a noun phrase. Okay. On land, they are slow and clumsy looking. Those are both adjective phrases, slow and then clumsy looking. Okay. Added together, since they're both adjective phrases, this makes sense. However, if we mix and match, now it doesn't make sense. The worst part, noun phrase, and clumsy looking, adjective phrase. Okay. So when we start um, combining phrases of different types, this is where it stops working. And understanding that's key because now we know that we shouldn't see noun phrase and adjective phrase together. Um, I actually really hate these slides, so I'm going to give you the brief overview and then we're going to skip a slide that I think is very confusing. So uh, constituency. Generally this is mentioned when you're talking about politics, like you are a constituent of someone's area or whatever, that's my senator or whatever, but constituency in linguistics is the phrase the word is in. Okay. So when we talk about constituent structure, we're talking about usually phrases building into sentences. Okay. And it's the idea that words are individual participants in their structure, okay. and you know that constituents are of a specific type if you can replace them and keep the, the grammar the same. Okay? Not the meaning, but the grammar. Okay? So if I have a noun phrase, um, I could replace that with any other noun and keep the same grammar. Now, this is the slide I'm going to skip because I just don't think this slide makes just a whole lot of sense. Um, it's from the book. You can read about it, but I at some point, it's, they convert this sentence from seeing the trout to he ran, and I don't think it makes their point very well, so we're just going to skip it aside. I meant to take it out. Okay. The idea of what they're saying, though, is a little easier to see on this slide. Okay. I have this noun phrase over here. Okay. That noun phrase breaks into a determiner, excuse me, V, and a nom what they're going to call a nominal phrase, which is just a second noun phrase that's adjective and noun. Okay. Um, if I can replace this nominal phrase with another nominal phrase, so I've got the little bear, I could replace that with the large dog. Okay. Grammatically, that retains the same uh, syntax. The meaning has changed because we've changed words, but the syntax stays the same. So I can replace one nominal phrase for another, and the sentence should still hold together. So what we're building up to is context-free grammar. Now, the chapter 9 that we won't have time to get to because we've had some holidays here um, covers, uh, wow, not context-free grammar, feature grammars. Whew, I was like, what? Where did it go in my brain? Feature grammars, which require um, you to program in context, basically. Okay. But a context-free grammar works pretty well. Okay. It's the idea that there's these set of rules, these iterative or recursive rules, that are used to generate sentences, so we should be able to do that with a computer, or we should be able to break sentences down with a computer. Okay. And we'll use the grammar module to define those. 
And a word of warning that if you're processing these and you don't get any output, that's because it either couldn't figure out the sentence structure based on your grammar, which these are hard to write, so it isn't too surprising, or um, it has multiple structures. And when you have multiple structures, those kinds of sentences are ambiguous. Okay. So if I can break a sentence down in more than one way, like the pajama shooting one, then the sentence is considered ambiguous. All right. So give me just one second to go blow my nose, and then we will come back to this slide. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Okay, so <clears throat> what symbols you're going to see throughout building these grammars is something like S for sentence. Okay. So something like the man walked will be an example sentence. NP for noun phrase. VP um, for verb phrase. PP for preposition phrase. Okay. You might see AP for adjective phrase. DET is determiners. N V and P for noun, verb, and preposition. Okay. So, sorry. Um, we're going to use these symbols, but they are arbitrary. All right. Oh, this slide got really long. Why is it so long? That should fit. Okay. So, when we build our parser, what we're going to do is create the constituents and their structure that conform to our specific grammar. This is the same kind of procedure that we did with tokenization, which is uh, part of, then we did part of speech tagging. So tokenization is breaking it down into words or to sentences. Then we did classification, and then we did chunking. So now we're just building up one more uh, parsing. Okay. And they're just going to be interpretations of these defined grammars. And so here are the options. Here is a tree, and we're going to try to build that tree giving my options. We'll evaluate this in the same way that we have evaluated nearly everything else using an accuracy kind of statistic. And the purpose of doing this is several fold. So we might be interested in um, uh, the process of language, like how do people understand syntax? How do we break down sentences so that we can understand the relationship between things? How do people do this? Because then I can write, given a good grammar breaker downer, so to speak, I can then build a grammar builder upper. Okay. So if I can break down a sentence into its structure and it's correct, I can then build new sentences based on that structure. So this is kind of the first step to a chat box. Okay. Um, or that weird meme that's like, I had a bot read thousands of lines of whatever, and here's what it came up with, and it's a joke. But that's kind of the idea, is if I can create something that um, can break down sentences, I can create something that can build sentences. <clears throat> so we're going to do two of these. First option is called recursive descent parsing. Okay. This sounds very, like, sci-fi. <laughs> That's not really that difficult. It's going to work from the top down. So it's going to take the whole, the whole idea, the, the input is a sentence. And then, okay, from that, I'm going to break it into noun phrase and verb phrase. And then I'm going to break that noun phrase into determinate and nominative phrase. And then the nominative phrase is an adjective and a noun. Okay. So find the sentence. Sentence tokenization. Break down each piece one at a time. Okay. So that's the descent part. Start from the top and work your way down. The lowest level goal is to find the noun phrases and verb phrases where the beginning of each of those starts with a noun or a verb. Okay. The leftmost side means the leftmost word. So this is considered a top-down parser, um, which is, uses a grammar to predict how to break those down. Okay. It's very similar to chunking. 
So we're going to start with the sentence. The sentence is kind of a light color, so it's hard to read. The dog saw a man in the park. Okay, so it starts with sentence. We figure out that there's noun phrase. The dog saw is our new verb phrase. Then we'll break down the noun phrase okay, until the noun is the leftmost object here. Okay. From that verb phrase, we'll start breaking down more, and then it... Um, gets pretty complex. There's a lot of steps that we skip from four to five here. This does backtrack, meaning when um, a set of rules can't be found, it will kind of back up and see if it can find a different set, which is going to cause us problems. So we'll talk about that in a second. Here's how you build one. Um, you write them in string formats. We have to use this uh, context-free grammar, is the code here, from string, meaning I'm going to write it in a string format. The triple quotes here are um, brain fart, are because we're doing multiple lines. <laughs> Sorry. Left-hand side here is the um, the label we're going to give to each object. The right hand side is how to break down and create that object. So a sentence is composed of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So that means at the second most level on our parse tree we should have noun phrase and verb phrase. In a verb phrase that can be a verb and a noun phrase or, here's that pipe, it means or, a verb, a noun phrase, and a preposition phrase. Preposition phrases can be prepositions and noun phrases. And then from there, um, we're going to label what verbs we might expect, what noun phrases we might expect. And here, the noun phrase can be a single noun, or a single proper noun, or determinant and a noun, or determinant and noun and a preposition phrase. Our determinants A and the my, our nouns man, dog, cat, telescope, park, and our prepositions in, on, by, with. So one of the biggest limitations to these grammars personally is that uh, you do have to define every possible word you're going to see. So it has to have the part of speech for every word, Obviously, this can be solved in a different way. Rather than writing them out uh, manually like this, which is what we'll do for, for our small assignment here, but if I were doing this practically, what I would do is uh, part of speech tag the document first okay, and um, label every option that way. So just, you know, noun is all of these options. And the preposition is all of these options. Okay. Then it gets especially tricky with words that can be multiple types. So we've defined our grammar. The next step is uh, to train. Right? No real training here. We're just using um, uh, the grammar we've already built. So the function here is recursive descent parser. And we put in our grammar. Okay, this is similar to chunking when we did regular expressions. Okay, so now we have a parser. We created a sentence, Mary saw a dog, and we just split it, split it into a list of words. La, 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 la. So these do have to be tokenized when you put them through. <clears throat> All right, and then this code, if there are multiple trees, meaning more than one possible combination of sentence structures, it will print them all out. But basically, parse dot parse here is the function that builds the sentence structure. And we only had one option, so this sentence is not ambiguous. And it's not really the cutest tree because it's not printing the like pretty syntax format. Or, but what we see is the sentence is the whole thing. Mary is the noun phrase. Here's the verb phrase. A verb phrase is a verb. A noun phrase is composed of a determinant and a noun. Okay. 
This sounds great. Working from the top down tends to work pretty well until okay. if you build a structure like this where a noun phrase can be a noun phrase plus a preposition phrase. Don't do that, basically. That is legal English, but it's not a good idea because that can get stuck in a loop because then this noun phrase could potentially be another noun phrase and preposition phrase, which could then be another one and another one and another one. Now, that captures recursion um, in language, but uh, the computer can get stuck. You sort of sit in this infinite loop and it'll crash. Okay. Parsing sometimes can be very slow and inefficient on very large texts. Uh, it will backtrack when um, you can no longer find a structure that fits, and so it can actually backtrack and correct a tree that it had right the first time. And I don't agree with this. This is from the book. It says the top-down nature of this is odd. Shouldn't we consider the input piece one at a time because that's how we actually read is one at a time? That's true, except that people are actually pretty good at reading entire phrase structures and then breaking them down as opposed to only doing things one word at a time. Because when, we, when we read, we don't actually read like word, 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 what we do is we kind of take in a phrase, break it down, take in another phrase, break it down. So practically what the brain does is somewhere in between this recursive descent and the next one, which is shift reducing. Okay. So we as humans are kind of both, um, and we'll talk about how you can combine both. All right, so a, a recursive descent parser starts with a sentence and breaks it down. A shift reduce parser starts with each word and builds it up. Okay, so we're working from the bottom up. So the big key here is to get that there are two different types of parsers, bottom up and top down, and then a mix of the two. So at, what it does is essentially reads one word at a time. So you get one word, get the next word, and as soon as it finds a sequence that maps onto the right side of the grammar. Okay, remember that the right side of the grammar is over here. So it's reading along and it finds, um, generally it starts at the bottom, a noun phrase. So it finds the word um, Bob. Okay. It will immediately take Bob and turn it into a noun phrase because it found something on the right, it converts it to something on the left. A recursive descent parser works the other way. It found the left and breaks it down to the right. And so it slowly shifts, here's the, where the name comes in, one word at a time. And then I've sometimes heard these called shift pop parsers, but it reduces the, the, the word stacks based on uh, the right-hand side, reduces them to the left-hand side. So if items in the current window match a right-hand rule, they get combined or re reduced into the left-hand rule. And then it shifts again, and you continue that replacement until you get to sentence. So here's an example. Here's the stack, as they call it. One shift, we would get the word the. Well, we know the word is a determinant because of our rules. We see that uh, V is a right-hand rule for determinant, so we'll give it a label. Then we get noun for, for dog, so we give that a label. But determinant noun, we know is a noun phrase, so it builds it up into noun phrase. Okay. So there's some steps in between three and four that it's kind of skipping. We'll get the word saw when we know that's a verb, um, and then it would keep going until we got to our of hierarchical structure of the sentence. So it's the same function on the same grammar. I'm sorry, it's a new function on the same grammar. That's what I was trying to say. So we'll use shift reduce parser on grammar one. So we don't have to write a separate grammar. They're written the same way. Um, we train that. Let's test it on the same sentence. 
So earlier we had RD for recursive descent parser, now we have SR for shift reduce parser. And we actually get the same structure, which is good because this is the appropriate sentence structure for this sentence. So you shouldn't, it shouldn't give you different answers going up or down. It does, though, when sentences are ambiguous or complex, super complex. Um, one of the cons to a shift reduce parser is there's no backtracking because you're just working one word at a time. So if you get to that last word and it can't figure out the, um, the last set of words, it just fails. Okay. And it only will ever find one tree. It does them in order of the lines in the grammar. So even if several trees are possible, you won't know. So this does not capture ambiguity very well because this maps onto what's sometimes called minimal attachment where phrases are built uh, as they're seen. Some other problems with shift reduced parsers, they can reach a dead end. So even if a sentence is grammatical, if you did not write the grammar good enough, it will fail. Um, or that original parse choice based on your grammar is a logical solution, but then you end up with these leftover words and essentially just like people, you go, what the hell am I supposed to do with this extra word? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> and so essentially the program just goes, eh, I don't know. Okay. And sometimes that occurs because there's multiple ways to reduce. And so which one should it pick first? Well, it picks whichever one you programmed first. Um, should it shift or reduce when both are possible options? Usually it reduces then shifts. And we could take that parser and sort of extend it to, to solve some of these problems. So these are not current state of the world problems. These are um, known shortcomings to shift reduce parsers. And so you might use what's called a left corner parser. We won't program one of these because um, they're evil, personally, but uh, you should know what the phrase is. Okay, so left corner parser is meant to be a hybrid of a shift reduce and a recursive descent. Okay, so it's a top-down parser. It mainly works by doing uh, recursive descent, breaking the sentence down. If that fails, it will then work on bottom-up filtering um, for what the next word should be. Um, and also can back up. So shift reduce does not back up, but recursive descent does. So you're kind of getting the pros of both of these. And essentially the way that works is it starts by reading the whole sentence in and pulling all of the possible left corners. Okay, what the heck is a left corner? If I look at a sentence struct, complete sentence structure, the left corner is the leftmost word in each phrase. Okay. So determinants are often left corners. Verbs, here's another determinant, a preposition in, and another determinant. Okay. So it's looking for the leftmost one in each phrasal structure. So let's say we wanted to parse John saw Mary's this is very simple. John and saw would be each word actually would be a leftmost corner because John is the leftmost word in the noun phrase. So is Mary and saw is the leftmost word in a verb phrase. So I would say this leftmost corner option works really well with lots of embedded clauses. So when a sentence is complex, okay, the simple sentence like this, no problems. Um, shift reduce or recursive descent works fine. Okay. One problem we might have is that just the, the definition of the grammar can get tricky. So we have these, this noun phrase, it's a determinant and a noun. And then we also have this possible option, determinant, noun, preposition, phrase. And then we also have this option, John, Mary, and Bob. Which noun phrase is the right one um, since all of these are left corners. Okay. So it's going to define this as a noun phrase, but which one should I start with, basically, because they're all possible options. All right. Um, phrase structure grammar, this is what we're doing. Focusing really is 
the focus of a phrase structure idea is to just think about what is possible part of speech rules that break this sentence down or build these sentences up. And what that's really doing is just saying that it is logical for a noun to be followed by a verb. This is not usually very predictive of what nouns can be followed by what verbs. Right? So uh, chapter 9 really covers this if you're interested in the idea of, of like subject verb matching. Right? So I walk, you walk, they walk, he walks, that damn s, right? Third person, present tense, English is very strange. <laughs> um, <clears throat> That's where a, a dependency grammar comes in, or a feature grammar, which is chapter 9. So with dependency grammar, uh, you're really actually more trying to map the um, relationships between words. With a feature grammar, you're trying to map the, the requirements for the rule for it to be grammatically correct. So when I mean that, I mean like you don't say the dogs. Well, you actually could say the dogs. Um, a dogs is incorrect because a implies singular, a dogs implies plural. So a, a feature grammar controls the features of the words. Transitive verbs require x, and intransitive verbs require y, that sort of thing. Um, this sort of, this dependency grammar is a bit more of a like way that we can plot meaning between things. Lost my chat window here. Oh, yeah, I knew that. I think they're still on there. Oh, no, I think I hit it completely. Did I hide it completely? Oh, I hit it completely. Here. Ta da! There. Done. <clears throat> um. Where was it? And dependency grammars. So dependency grammars to me are ways that we can build up um, relationships between words. I think this is much harder, and I like this uh, diagram picture <laughs> to me is very confusing. Um, but generally, here's how this works: you look for the verb. Okay, the verb is often the driver in a sentence. It tells you what kind of noun you have. Is it singular? Is it plural? Is it first person? Is it third person? The verb determines this. Okay. Then, based on the verb type, so verbs can require a direct object or not, we would expect some sort of object. Objects are going to have some sort of determiner, and then they might also have a modification, like an adjective or another preposition phrase. So. Back to our I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Okay, shot is the head, it's the most important piece, dependent piece in the sentence. So shot is usually going to be a subject that's going to be singular, but it could be plural. Shot's kind of ambiguous. Um, you have to shoot something though, so we'll get some sort of object. Here's our elephant. Okay, elephant's got a determiner modifier. And then, if we interpret that the elephant is in the pajamas, which is what this is, uh, the elephant is being modified by this phrase. Okay. If we said the pajamas belong to me, then I is mo being modified. So really, this sort of thing allows us to map the relationship between noun verbs and their nouns, and nouns to each other. What this would tell me is the who's the actor in the sentence, who's the actee being acted upon, and what um, descriptors do I have for those noun actors. Now we won't do an example of these because I find that the generally if you're going to do if you're doing parsing you're doing the other stuff, right? So we will do examples of shift reduce and recursive descent, but if you wanted to write a dependency parser. You essentially keep those sort of left-hand, right-hand rules, and you um, sort of draw lines between uh, the head of the sentence and its modifier. Okay. So shot is related to 
uh, the actor, the acted upon, and then here we also have it related to in spec uh, in the sense that the modifying phrase here is attached to the verb. Elephant is modified by an and in. In is uh, modifying pajamas, and pajamas is modifying my. And so uh, I, with these, I to build them yourself, you don't do quite this obvious of a map of like each word in the sentence. What you do is you sort of do generalized mapping. So verbs are generally tied to the nouns in front and behind them. Uh, this is just an example, like a specific example to this sentence. But then otherwise you treat them uh, in the same fashion, dependency grammar, you do dependency grammar dot parse okay, to parse a, a new sentence. These are considered projective if all of the pieces can be added without crossing each other. This version is projective. However, if I say that this noun modifier actually is tied to I, this is not projective anymore because now this noun modifier crosses the rest. So the, the interpretation of the sentence where I'm the one in the pajamas is not projective. Uh, the interpretation where the elephant is in the pajamas is. So that all of the words and their descendants, their constituents, are sort of a continuous sequence of meaning. So we can each add each phrase without backtracking, basically. And that's an interesting concept, because backtracking is one of the key features to readability. So if you require a person, as you're writing, the person to backtrack because of the clause or something that you've added at the end of a sentence, those are grammatically more complex. They take a lot more mental energy to read, and they also are more confusing. And so what you could do with this sort of dependency parsing is uh, determine which sentences are difficult to read. Okay. So I, I get a lot of that. Because of the work that I do, I get a lot of YouTube ads for Grammarly. <laughs> I, so they either think that I cannot write or because I'm always writing about writing um, that they should advertise Grammarly to me. <laughs> And one of the things that it does is it looks at those kinds of dependency relations. I assume. I don't know their algorithm, but um, it, it looks for overused words and phrase structures that are wrong, but it also has these like suggestions about complex sentences, and that's one of the things it looks for, is um, embedded clauses. <clears throat> All right. So... Uh, this is how you'd use one to parse a new sentence. So it's projective dependency parser, which is a lot of letters, on our grammar we wrote earlier. Okay. At the moment, the only thing the grammar can do is break down our original sentence because when we built this, excuse me, um, when we built this thing, we didn't build this based on verbs and nouns, we built it on the individual words. So this could be, this would be better if it were more flexible and built out of, of parts of speech rather than words. Um, but here's an example of multiple trees. So if we parse this, it um, suggests that um, I shot an elephant in my pajamas, or I shot an elephant, um, and then the in my pajamas is a second phrase separate. Okay, so the key here is this little closed parenthesis here on an versus here. Okay. So this is either um, projective, meaning it's each one's embedded, or it's not projective, right, meaning that they are two separate phrases. So there's two interpretations. And that matches our understanding of ambiguity. Either the elephant's in the pajamas or we are. Personally, I think these are interesting in the sense that it allows me to think about the relationship between verbs and their nouns. I think a feature grammar works better for this. Um, 
I find these a little confusing. I think sinus trees are a lot easier to read. Uh, and so that's the picture version of this, right? So I shot the elephant that's in my pajamas, or I shot an elephant, and in my pajamas actually should be over here with I. Ooh, what did I do? Oh, that's fancy. There it goes. So how do we determine what's head? Like, how do we figure out um, how we're going to build these structures? And so heads are meant to be things that determine the way a sentence is made. Um, and they determine the semantic class of a sentence. Okay, that's just a fancy phrase for what is possible given that head. Okay. So if you have a, if you make the determinant a head and it's single determinant, A, that class means that only single nouns can come next. Heads required, this is why most people pick verbs. Verbs are always required in sentences. Sometimes nouns are implied, but verbs are always required. Um, and the form of the dependents are determined by the head. Okay. And that just means um, a subject verb matching, usually. So that's why most people pick verbs as their head, is because they are, the re in English anyway, are the, the driving force for what is n also required. So if the verb requires a direct object, there better be one coming. Okay. If a verb um, is singular, you don't see the word they. Okay. It determines what noun can be put in front and behind it. Okay. Except that English is now using the singular they, okay, we. Is a better option. So it's kind of an interesting thing going on with English right now. It has a lot to do with like the gender sort of commentary, but um, using the singular they, okay, is it allowed or not? Okay. It's something that English has done before and is still doing, but now has become like this weird co conversation. So I'm sure like linguists everywhere are just sort of like, we've been doing this this whole time. <laughs> Um, but people are like, no, they cast to be plural. Anyway, so it's kind of an interesting to, thing to watch um, if you want to like ca a current crisis in grammar in English. It's about the word they. Okay. Um, right. So let's say for some reason instead you decide to pick preposition as the head. Okay. Um, so prepositional phrases have a preposition as the head and a noun phrase is dependent on that preposition. So this also makes sense because if you say something is in something, there are a lot of things that are excluded coming next, right? If you say something is on something or under something, right? There are rules now about what semantically will make sense. Um, so now the noun phrase that comes next has to have something that can be in or on. Right? And this just is more explicit and what can come next. A context-free grammar does not have that kind of rule. Right? It is just context-free. In preposition, any noun phrase can come next. Whatever noun phrase you want. Right? A dependency grammar is like, wait, some noun phrases can't come next. And then a feature grammar gets even more specific. So that's chapter 9. Um, what it, it even more explicitly sets the rules for what is required after maybe a preposition. So if you have the word in, you cannot have X, Y, and Z. Uh, okay, so let's think now about verbs. Okay. So verbs, uh, like I said, are kind of the, the main show. Um, so you can have something like a verb and then an adjective. Uh, since adjectives normally modify nouns, but a verb phrase could be verb adjective. So um, I could talk about the pizza was good, which is uh, what I had for dinner, which is what I keep having uh, having to <clears throat> pause for a minute. Um, so good normally as an adjective modifies the first noun, but since I'm looking at ver the verb as the head, I know that there is a noun and maybe an adjective next. I could use the word saw 
which implies that the next thing I should have is a noun phrase, because you have to see something. I could have an entire, ooh, sorry, I could have an entire sentence. Okay. That and thought and said are words that cue that there's a whole sentence coming next. And then I could have a verb, a noun phrase, and a preposition phrase, and a really popular version for this is put. So I put the pizza on the table, okay, right? So put as the verb requires a noun phrase and a where, okay, and another preposition phrase. So by knowing what the verb is, I know what comes, I know what has, could come next, right? If the verb is was, it could be, it's probably an adjective. If the verb is saw, it's probably a noun phrase. If it's thought, it's probably a whole other sentence. Okay. Um, and I don't know why this is called valency in the chapter, um, because I think of valence, valence as positive and negative. So I would say that this is um, more about semanticity. Right? So certain verbs require certain phrases next. So here's some examples of this. The squirrel was frightened. Frightened is our adjective modifying the noun. Uh, chatter er 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 that saw the bear. Thought Buster was angry. Put the fish on the log. So by simply making the verb our head, we know what happens next. All right, we've already said all this. So the scary part is this could get very complex very fast. Right? There are a lot of English verbs. <laughs> How do I program all of these? Right? Um, there are pretty set rules. You still have to deal with creativity and ambiguity as your biggest two hurdles to writing grammars, but um, in general, there's a set set of, of different combinations. Um, so you pretty much after a was will not see a sentence. Okay. So the squirrel was, buster was angry. That makes no sense, right? And this would be a verb sentence phrase. So with was, there is no S afterwards. Okay. With saw, there's no adjective. Um, with uh, thought, there should be a sentence. So if you heard this, you would go thought the bear what? Because you're waiting for another verb, right? And Joe put on the log, put what on the log? So um, we can see that you can't mix and match these. And so that leads us into what what is actually determining this set of rules? Can we get more flexible with our our grammars so that we can cover more um, phrases without uh, defining every noun or every verb, right? And yes, these fall into some distinct categories. So uh, intransitive verbs, something like barked, they don't require any kind of objects afterwards. Um, they just are. Okay, so there could be something next or not. Transitive verbs that require an object afterwards. Okay. Diative or sometimes called ditransitive verbs require a direct and indirect object. Okay. So gave. Uh, a dog to the man, so they require uh, put is also one of these. Um, put what on where, uh, and then a, um, a sentence verb. So it looks like centennial, but it's not sentential. Basically, this means a sentence is coming. Verb, something like said or thought. Okay. Um, so instead of writing our grammar where we have to define every verb. So saw is going to have, you know, X after it, and said will have Y after it. We could instead say saw is an uh, a transitive verb. Transitive verbs as a class require direct objects, noun phrases, okay? um, and define them this way. So when we're writing our grammar, instead of just using V for verb, we break down verbs into all of these categories. We could also consider modifiers. So prepositional phrases, adjectives, and adverbs are always modifiers. So they're modifying usually some sort of noun or, in adverbs cases, the verb. 
Modifiers are optional, and there can be a bunch of them. Compliments are required. So I love the word really because it's such a flexible word, but it could also be a real pain. So the squirrel really was frightened. So really here um, is modifying frightened through was, right? Really saw the bear, we're modifying saw. Um, so we can, it kind of depends on what word you think it might modify. Um, and we've put them all in front of the verb, but they're not always modifying the verb. We just happen to put them there. Uh, so this is where we start to think about, we're really, in this dependency grammar, really slowly merging into feature grammars. So feature grammars indicate where a modifier might occur and what word it should be modifying. Um, and define that a little more. But something to consider. Complements are phrases that are required. So um, saw the bear right, is a required phrase because of the type of verb it is. The really part is just a modification. Okay. So it's not really, I was going to say, it's not really required. It's not actually required. For the sentence to be correct. All right. So to scale this up, we've talked about just a couple of small things with English, okay? Where the verbs are the drivers of the sentence, and um, preposition phrases and determinative phrases can get a, are easy to mark because those don't change. Right? So prepositions and determiners are pretty set words. Okay, we get lots of different nouns, but the is the all the time. Building this up, though, to account for all kinds of different types of writings and styles is really difficult. Okay. Um, so the goal of this breaking down procedure, or of course it's send or shift reduce or whichever one you're using, is to understand um, meaning and depth. So can I tell you how complex this article will be to read based on how complex the sentence structure is? Um, and can we identify what sentences might be ambiguous so we can rewrite them? Uh, then, if I can build something that can break down sentences, that means that I have now a grammar that I can use to build legal sentences. So I think these are often used, if they're not for academic purposes, right, are used to build chat, legal chats, because to know how to, to respond to someone, you first have to know what's leaving grammatically legal. Then you get into shades of meaning and ambiguity even more. Um, so uh, one of the big questions I like to ask on the final is about ambiguity and creativity. Why is this such a problem? Like, it's a beautiful thing about language as a human, that we have this ability to be creative and um, ambiguity often is used in humor. So but why is it such a problem for natural language processing? Right? And that's because it's, it lends itself to an infinite number of possibilities. Right? If things are ambiguous, that means that there are multiple ways to write the sentence structure. And how do I tell the computer which one's right? Okay. If things are um, creative, how do we capture all of them with a simple set of rules? Because the more complex the rules are, the more likely the whole thing is to break. And so you can learn a lot more. Um, there are some really cool grammar projects, like the Lexical, Lexical Functional Grammar Program Project, which is just a freaking mouthful, or the Head Driven Phrase Structure Grammar, or Lexical Tree Adjoining Grammars. So there are these um, predefined grammars that, instead of building your own, most people use instead. Um, but obviously not, these are not covered in every language. Right? So these are places that people start and then modify for their own. And um, some of those are probabilistic grammars. Okay? So a context-free grammar, and remember, does not require that you know what the verb is to then build the verb phrase. A dependency grammar does. But what I could do is sort of take 
half of the dependency grammar, which is about probabil the probability of word phrases together, and the context-free grammar, and then use that to predict what should come next. And this is kind of like Bayes, the naive Bayes predictors, um, and just uses some sort of prior probability. So here's the most likely thing that's going to happen, given what I've already seen. Um, and then really what the where a lot of the work is going is in um, feature grammars. Okay. And those are really useful if you want to write something that talks back. Okay. Because it allows you to get into those little fine-grained rules on what is appropriate given this verb, this noun's okay, and that noun's not. 